It all began in the fall of 1981. Some people never find what I found. Walking onto my college campus on the first weekend of school, I saw her. She was walking down the center of campus. I was with an older student in my dorm room looking out the window. Turning to my friend, I said to him, I'm going to marry that girl. He looked out the window at the girl walking down the middle of campus. Then he turned to me and said, no, you're not. That's Jane. She's the most spiritual girl on campus and you don't have a chance. The following week, I found out that she was on my sister floor and that we would be seeing a lot of each other. As a matter of fact, she went to my first football game and fell in love with what she calls my chicken legs. On the second weekend of school, I walked into the cafeteria and I saw her seated at a table with her sophomore friends. Walking through the line, I kept my eye on her to make sure that she didn't leave before I was seated at her table. Noticing she had a couple of seats left, my friend and I sat down with these total strangers. But this is when my personality kicked into high gear. Looking at Jane in front of all of her friends, I sat down next to her and introduced myself. And then I asked, what is your name? She replied, Jane. And she promptly continued eating her meal without looking at me. It was right there that I realized I had a chance. My reply was confident. Great to meet you, Jane. Do you know that you are the second girl I've met here at college? And two is my lucky number. I still don't believe I said that. Needless to say, the whole table was in disbelief, but I couldn't back down now. The chances of that working were pretty low, but in that conversation at our first lunch, I did find out where Jane went to church and felt called there the next week. I made sure to sit right in front of her and her friends, and that morning, I worshiped like I had never worshiped before. I had a lot to prove. And after the service, I walked up to her and her friends in the lobby and simply said to them, hey, what are you doing tonight? Would you like to go to church with me? Realizing what was going on, one of her friends pushed Jane forward and said, oh, she would love to go to church with you. I told her, I'll pick you up at 5.30 and walked away before she could give me an answer. As I walked away with my friend, he said, what are you gonna do? You don't have a car. I said, I'll find one. We dated for the next 34 years. 31 of those years, we were married. We had three children, four grandchildren, and we're in ministry together for 31 years. But that's when everything ended. You see, some people never find what I lost. After battling cancer for the previous 16 months, Jane passed away. It rocked our Western mindset that viewed our marriage as near perfect and our family as untouchable. We really had only known harmony as a couple, satisfaction with our kids and fulfillment in our work. But this is where I had the firsthand glimpse of my broken palace, a place of beauty and beast, of more and least, where dragons and jesters, kings and queens all meet. It was at this time that I would realize I'll never kiss her again. My last child would not have his mother at his wedding. Our grandchildren yet to be born would not know their grandmother. And yet, although everything changed, really nothing has changed. See, I'm not the only one in the room who's hurting. I'm not the only one in the room who's gone through difficulty or hardship or chaos or pain. All of us in this room would like to change something in our life. We wish we could hit rewind and go back. We wish we could hide it from everybody else. We wish we didn't have that part of our story. Could we take that chapter out? Listen, I'm not the only one who's gone through addictions, loss, pain, sickness. 
I'm not the only one in this room who wish we could change something. But I want you to know it doesn't matter whether you're in control of changing that or not because God is with you beginning to the end. God said to me as I was going through this, I was with you when you're married and I will be with you when you're single. I'm about to come on. Whoever said that, thank you very much. Listen, I want you to know God is the same yesterday, today, and he will be tomorrow. No matter what you're going through, it doesn't matter. I know we look at our world and you look at what's going on and you're thinking, how could God make something out of this? Have you read Genesis chapter one? Right? We're in the midst of chaos, darkness, void, nothingness. The Holy Spirit moves into that moment and creates out of nothing. Hear me, God is not intimidated by darkness. In fact, he does his greatest work in the midst of our greatest need. Did somebody hear me? Yeah, okay. I'm going to, this side is shouting me down. I'm going to stay on this side for a minute, okay? But let me, let me tell you something. It doesn't matter how bad it gets. It doesn't matter uh, of the racism that's dividing our country. It doesn't matter if a government can't figure out what's right and what's left. It, can't ma it doesn't matter that your family is falling apart, your kids won't come to church, your parents won't come to church, or your body is wrecked with sickness. Hear me. He is the same whether he is given or whether he takes. The problem we have is that we serve him conditionally. And we shouldn't be serving him conditionally. Some of you, some of you have this problem with serving God conditionally. Well, if God will, then I will. And if he keeps giving, then I'm good. But when he takes... God, how could you? Why, why are children starved? God, how come my grandmother? God, it wouldn't be fair if you, if you were who you said you were. How could, right? We have all of these questions. Hear me, God is not intimidated by your questions. It's your doubt that he can't deal with. Questioning and doubting are two different things. Doubts don't look for answers. Questions are looking for answers. God, bring us answers this morning to the things that are ripping us apart. Across this room, I can feel the pain. This isn't my story. This is our story. Front to back, side to side. People on, camp, uh, on, on the internet, listening on the internet campus. Those who will hear this story. God, heal. We pray. We pray in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. will you hug the person next to you? Come on, squeeze them. If you can, kiss them on the cheek. <laughs> yes. I, I want you to go to Job chapter one. Job chapter one. Yes, yeah, somebody said, oh, no. <laughs> Hello. Job chapter one. Listen, I believe, I believe in moments. I believe that moments create movements. C can I say that again? <laughs> right? I believe that moments create movements. I, I believe in moments because moments don't have to be just memories. Moments can become, listen, moments don't have to be memories or museums. I remember when God, right, moments can become movements in your life that change you forever. I, I know this, and I'm praying, I've been praying this for weeks, knowing that I would be here with you. In Job chapter 1, we have our story again. This is not just Job's story. This is our story given to us from the hand of God. Maybe you're here this morning and you're not sure how to deal with it. Maybe you're here this morning and you're unsure what you're going to do next. Job is our example. You see, this, this story begins much like my story and yours. Look at verse 1 of Job chapter 1. Now, there was a man in the land of us whose name was Job. And that man was blameless. 
Did you see that man was blameless and he was upright? One who feared God and turned away from evil. You would think that just in that description, that, that like you and me, that God would at least protect him. Right? I, I mean, this is a this is a good this is a good dude. How could something that's about to happen? How? Not him. Look at the description. It's a remarkable thing that none of us are outside. None of us are protected from discipline, hardship, suffering, pain, and loss. It's just a matter of how you see it. If you're an athlete in the room, you understand this. No pain, no gain. No championships without the weight room, right? If you're a farmer, if you've ever been into farming, you understand that unless that seed goes into the ground and it what? Dies. It cannot bear fruit. If you're a soldier, you know that basic training in the moment it doesn't feel right, but it may save your life in the field. It's all how you look at it. As a matter of fact, Paul said, Paul said these words, if you're not going through hardship, you're a bastard. If you're not going through hardship, you are illegitimate. <laughs> I thought it would get kind of quiet there. Yeah. And the preacher just swore. No, no, that's King James. God just said it. Paul said, all of this stuff that I'm going through is for his glory. Amen. Right? Remember when Paul said, God gave to me this thorn in the flesh. I'm thinking, mm, I don't want that. Paul asked for God to remove it. Right? Paul asked for God to remove it and God says no. Right? And some of you have a problem with that. Because if God just keeps giving, I'm good. I'm real good with him. But as soon as he starts taking, right? And, and Paul basically just says, God, take this from me. God's answer is no. My grace is better. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's just keep reading from Job. Enough on Job. Listen, you don't want to get to heaven and sit at Job and Paul's table anyway. When you go to the cafeteria, just stay away from their table. Because if you walk into if you walk into heaven's cafeteria and you sit down next to Job and Paul, and you and, and you're like, man, I just barely made it. <laughs> it's been rough living in America. You know what I'm saying, man. I don't know about you guys. I don't know how you got here, but it's been really shh, shh. <laughs> realize who you're sitting next to, right? Verse two. Seven sons and da three daughters were born to him. Also, his possessions were, and it lists them, 7,000, 3,000, 500, all of these incredible things. So that this man, look at the end of verse 3, was the greatest of all the people of the East. Isn't that a remarkable description? That you would think that he would be somehow protected because of his life, because of who he was. That's how we think in America. I live in the West. Do you, do you, do you know my last name? Do you know who, do you know who I am? Do you, do, you, do you know that I own a company? I, I'm a teacher. I have a lot of money. And sometimes we think that way. But those kind of things did not keep Job from going through it. If I had the time, I would read what happens in the next few verses as Satan approaches God. It says, you know, the Job guy, the only reason that he serves you is because you've protected him, because you've blessed him. The only reason that he serves you is because you put a hedge of protection around him. And God says, oh, really? Is that what you think? And they begin to barter back and forth. And Satan says to God, you, you, you know what? Let, let me at him. Let me, and I'll show you. And God says, okay, all, all right. You can, you can take the cattle. You can take uh, the servants. You can take the property. All, all, you, the, the houses. 
all of, you can take the children and you can even take his health, but you can't touch his soul. Uh, l- listen, I don't know about you, but, it, but if I'm Job, I'm listening in going, uh, no, 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 not me, not me. How about the guy down the road? <laughs> right? Don't you want to barter with God sometimes? I mean, that dude down the road is nasty boy, man. Ha, ha, me? No, 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 no. And then God says, no, I got this. And you're like, mm, you better. <laughs> and could we move the line? Can we move, right? God draws a line. You know he does. He draws a line and says this, 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 and this, but not this. I, if I'm Job, I'm like, God, can we like, can I get the health back? How about the kids? God, give me the kids. Can I have the kids back? One kid? <laughs> uh, take, take the cattle. I don't need the cattle. I can get new cattle. The house is all good. Right? And we start moving the line on God. You, you do that, and so do I. We say, God, that's not fair. Let me tell you something. God is playing chess while we're playing checkers. Oh, oh yeah. When you say things like, God, that's not fair, you don't, you don't know what you're saying. It's not, it's not fair to this, okay? It's not fair to this, but it is to that. Amen. Amen. Hello? Listen, I love you, but I came to tell you the truth this morning. Listen, 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 Snowflake. He did not. Yeah, he did. Do you know they call you snowflakes in America? The, the millennials and the Gen Z, they call you snowflakes. Mom and dad, you can jump in on that too, okay? I was talking about this concept in a lecture at a university recently. And at the end of the con- the, this, this lecture, this college student comes up and he's like, snowflake, I like that. I'm like, no, 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 you don't get, you don't get it. It's not a compliment. I mean, I know you're unique and everything, but here today, gone tomorrow, heat hits, right? You're going, l- listen, sometimes God chooses to work in ways we don't understand. I-, I know you know this. It's just hard to accept this because we're generally as Americans, give me, give me, give me. My name is Jimmy. And as soon as God starts to take. That's when, the, that's when the storage, that's when the, the conditional love comes. Listen, you wouldn't, you wouldn't love your spouse or your children. You wouldn't love your best friend conditionally. We love each other unconditionally. Why would we treat God any differently? Hear me. In the middle of this story, the bad news comes. But God is always good. Whether it's good news or bad news, we serve a good God. God cannot be somebody that he is not. Do you understand this? God cannot be somebody he is not. And the Bible says that he is love and he is good. Now, sometimes his love and his goodness doesn't feel right. And it doesn't look right. And and it's not what we would choose. But hear me, it's coming from goodness. Goodness. Just like the farmer and just like the, the athlete and just like the, the soldier. It may not feel like it, but this is for your good. Amen. You ever had a parent say that? You're not going to like this. This is going to hurt you more than, right? Uh, not really. <laughs> Tell that to the backside. Listen, God has a way. God has a way. And if you will love him unconditionally, you'll understand his way better. You will. You'll understand his way better. Because God's playing chess and we're playing checkers. We don't see, we don't see it out in front. We don't see the whole thing. And so this bad news comes, you know, the story, the man comes to him and tells him, the man comes to him and tells him, another man comes to him and tells him this bad news. You ever had a really bad day? <laughs> I mean, read that. But then what happens is Job's response. Look at, look at the response. When, the, when all of this news comes in verse 20 of Job chapter 1, then Job arose at hearing this news and he tore his robe, shaved his head, and he fell to the ground 
and he complained. Right? Is that what it's, Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, no. No, that's... Let me try verse 20 again. Then Job arose after hearing this news, tore his robe, shaved his head, fell to the ground, and blamed God. Right? Did I get... Oh, my bad, my bad, my bad. Let me, let, me, let me try it again. Let me try it again. Then Job arose at hearing this news. He tore his robe, shaved his head. He fell to the ground, and he isolated himself from everyone else. No, 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 no. I'm sorry. I was reading from your Bible. I told you I love you, but I'm going to tell you the truth. That's how we respond to bad news. We isolate ourselves. I'm the only one. God, I'm the only one. You are not the only one. We blame God. God, if you would have... And God says, then you'll never get what I want for you. And then we start complaining. And we forget that God gives and God takes. And if he's not the same, hear me, if I'm not praising him the same when he's giving, that I'm praising him when he's taking, I'm serving him, I'm serving him conditionally. See, and Job arose at hearing this news, tore his robe, and shaved his head. You know what? You, when Job tore his robe, he was saying, I'm not the man of the East anymore. This is not my title. I don't deserve anything. What Job was saying is, I humble myself before you. This incredible news. Everything is gone. Except for a complaining wife. <laughs> I mean, she stayed. Hello. Fellas, that is not a place for amen. Okay, do, do not say amen. DJ, where are, you, where are you at? Do not say amen right here. You haven't even been married yet. So right now, just say like glory or something. That's all he's left with. And he tears his robe and says, I am not the greatest anymore. And he shaves his head. And what he was doing when he did that symbolically, what Job was saying is, I'll start all over. God, I'm starting all over with you. I'm going back to a child. I'm going back to my faith. I'm going back to my relationship with you. I am not who I was. I am starting all of this life over with you. And then what did he do? He fell to the ground and he, say it with me, he worshiped. That's your response. Millennial, Gen Z, snowflake, that's your response in every situation. It doesn't matter whether you're in prison and you're Paul. It, it, it doesn't matter. Wh whatever you're going through, praise is always the response in every situation. We're at our daughter's, our only daughter's wedding. It's supposed to be the greatest day of your life. I mean, I'd married off one son, and that was just like getting rid of another, you know, you know, you, you know, know what I'm saying. But it's your daughter. Mm. Halfway through the day, in perfect health, we had played tennis that week. We had had bike ride that week. Jane had never been sick in her life. And in the course of that day, in a matter of four to six hours, she began to become ill. She grew over 25 sores all over her body in four to six hours. Headaches and couldn't stand. And we kissed our daughter and son-in-law goodbye, said goodbye to the family. And I'm going, taking her home because we're exhausted. From plan she's exhausted from planning a wedding. And on the way home, she says, honey, I, I really don't feel well. I need to go to the hospital. I, I check her into the hospital. We get to the emergency room and her beautiful gown and my tuxedo, we exchange it for rags for the next 28 days. As they told me, about 12 hours of tests into Sunday afternoon, came to me and the doctor says, Jane has two to three, two to, two to four months to live. 
And I'm thinking, what? We just wedding kids. This isn't fair. And I walk into the room and I tell her the news and she curls up into a ball in the bed and she said, is this real life? And we began to worship in the ICU room. <laughs> we did. And for the next few weeks, every person that came into that room heard Jane's story of faith. Two PKs, pastor's kids, who were running from the faith, she led back to Christ in the ICU room as they walked into the room over the course of four weeks, et cetera, et cetera, so many. Listen, what was our response going to be? Fast forward, it is the last few weeks of her life, 16 months later after she had just she just killed it. Lost the hair, but never complained. Still continued to mentor four young ladies in college who have come over to our house and serve and clean our pl place and take care of her. And On the night before she went into a coma, we brought the children over. Everyone's there, and Jane began to prophesy to the kids. In that moment, knowing that these were the last hours of her life, she began to prophesy to the kids. And then she turned to me in front of the family. And she said, this is what Jaron needs. And this is what Jory needs. And this is what Just needs. This is how I would, you know, as a father, I'm thinking, no, you, you can't, I can't do this. There's no way. The kids leave. We go to sleep that night. Hear me. We had never had end of life discussions. Never had end of life. I wasn't going out that way. I was going out fighting. We had never had end of life discussions until that night. That night as we're falling asleep, she said, I think I'm finished. And I said, no, no, no. She said, no, no. Honey, you're not listening to me again. <laughs> again. <laughs> Husbands know what I'm talking about. You're not listening to me again. I'm finished, but he's not done with you. I've done everything he's called me to do. And then we began to talk about heaven. And I said to her, if you pass, I'm going to lay hands on you and pray for you one more time. And she said, don't you dare. We fell asleep that night. I got up, checked on her, and she had slipped into heaven. About 2.34 in the morning, I walked around, got down on my knees, and I laid hands on her. And I asked God, God, I know you can. Thousands of prayers, thousands of prayers all over the world. God, I want to dance with Jane one more time. And nothing. And he said to me, I was with you when you were married and I will be with you when you are single. And his presence, hear me, his presence in that moment was greater than an answer to my request. W would I have ch changed it? Yes. I got up, I kissed her, I never saw her again, and I walked out of the room, and I went over to my chair, and I hit my playlist, and I began to worship. His presence was more important to me in that moment than an answer to my request. Hear me, God doesn't have to do one more thing for you. Hear me, look at me, look at me. God doesn't have to do one more thing for you. He's already done enough. God doesn't have to lift his hand. God doesn't have to unfold his arms. God could stay on his throne, never answer another prayer, and he's still God. I know, I know you're having a hard time with that. No, 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 not my God. Hear me. 
If you know him that well, you understand what I just said. His presence is way more important than his presence. Y'all know what I'm saying? Because some of you are like Christmas morning. You'll serve God when you got your presence, but that's more important than his presence. Just give me the presence. Just give me the pre. No, no. Hear me. Prayer is not about getting. Prayer is about knowing. And when you are settled, hear me, when you are settled with that, and you can turn your circumstances into praise, you conquer everything that comes against you. As I worshiped in that room, downtown Minneapolis where I live, 16th floor, as I worshiped in that place, his presence filled that room and has been with me ever since. I wish, I wish she could see the man that I am today. I wish she could see the person that I've become today through this. I wish she could see my response. I mean, I know the theologians, half the theologians say she can, and the other half say she can't because she's busy. But hear me. God's greatest work sometimes cannot be seen until the end. You ever heard of the magnum opus? The magnum opus is the greatest work of the artist. I have a friend, his name is Eric. He's a painter. And he paints all over the world. And he'll come to a crowd and they'll start music and worship and he'll move to this canvas as large as that screen and he'll start painting on this. And it's on this huge easel and as he's painting, you're looking at this mess saying, I don't get it. I thought you were good. I could do that. I could take some paint, throw it up there. I, I, I could do that. I could do that. That's right. And then by the time he's finished, he says to the crowd, he says, how many of you feel like that right now? How many of you feel like that's right? And then he turns and he goes to this canvas and he, he reveals the true art by flipping it upside right. And as he does, this incredible portrait that he'd been painting comes to life and you realize he had been painting upside down. And that's what our lives look like sometimes, doesn't it? It looks like it's upside down. It looks like it's not quite finished. It looks like a maniac has been writing the story of my life until until the end. I'm not even finished with my story and I love what he's doing. Do you understand me this morning? He's not even finished with my story and I've totally accepted what he's doing in my life. Do I miss my wife? Yes. Do my, children, my, my daughter just had a child and she couldn't be there. Do you know what that's like? Of course I wish I could rewrite the story, but I've accepted his presence into my life without needing his presence gifts. Because the greatest work of the artist sometimes is only, unre only revealed in the end. Will you stand across this place? Listen. The two greatest story, sto parts of this story of Job are Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 42. I mean, all the other stuff that happened in the middle is just the mess. It's all that stuff is just trying to work it out. But as you move through this entire story, you realize God had a purpose for the pain. And he has that for you too. Because hear me, the same restrictions that God gave to Satan over Job are the same restrictions that God has given to Satan over you. He can only go so far. Don't move the line. Don't move the line. Accept where he's drawn it. Accept where he's drawn it. And praise him. Because praise is always 
the response in every situation. In Job 42, you know, the, you know the very end of the story. Forgive me for hurrying. You know the very end of the story. Job is confronted by God with all of these questions. Job, do you think I cannot handle this? I flung stars into space. I told the sea this far, no further. I blew the currents into the sky to lift the eagle as it flies. Do you think that I cannot deal with your situation? And Job responds, forgive me. It is I who do not understand the Almighty. For I've heard, listen, I've heard about you but now my eyes see. See, listen, listen. I gotta introduce to you the President of the United States. I know his, his family. I know where he's from. I, I know his party platform, but I do not know the President. And some of you are the same way. You could introduce to us God, but you do not know him because there are some things, listen, 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 there are some things about God you can only know through suffering. And you are limited in your knowledge if you have not gone through hardship. Father, heal this morning through our response of worship. Listen, we're gonna sing this song as we do. You're hurting in this room, I know it. We, we fill the front of this place up in the first service. There won't even be enough room now, but hear me. I do not want you to leave with your problem. I know you're thinking right now, wow, we're done five minutes, six minutes early. No, we're not done. It's time to pray for you. I wanna meet you right down here. If you are struggling with a situation that you want to see changed, I want you to step out as you're singing this right now. Will you? Come on. Come on. You never stop. You never stop working. Come on. say this as nice as I can okay but I work with young people so I'm just going to say it the way I'd say it to young people I know there are so many of you that need to come yet and you haven't come and here's what's going to happen if you just sit there and think well God can touch me where I'm at you know what he could or you could respond to him because you never have all you've been doing is sitting there complaining and blaming and isolating you I told you I love you I love you deeply, but I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm not your pastor. I can be gone in a minute. R pastor will be back, okay? Hear me. Some of you are still dealing with it, and you thought, good, they're there. God could just touch me where I'm at. You know what? That's what you've always done with your problem. And if you keep doing the things you're doing, you're going to get the things you got. You've got to do something different if you want God to touch you and heal you. We're going to sing it one more time and then we're going to pray. In one minute, we're going to pray for these that have come. But come on. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop.
come. Amen. Let's pray for those that are saying, I'm not, listen, I want you to know if you haven't come, everybody knows you still have a problem. You know what I'm saying? I, 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 listen, you may not come for a good reason. You don't need to. But I know there are some of you who are thinking, man, I can't move. Or they're going to think they already, they already know you got a problem. So why not walk away from it? Amen. I need some prayer warriors to come and, and pray with this crowd. Come on, will you come right now? You're mature out there. Maybe your friend is here. Will you come? Come and help us pray. Come right now. Come on. We're not going to go through this alone. Come on, we need 20, 30 people to come and pray with them. Come on, your friend came. Don't let him come alone. Right, right? Reach out, reach, reach out right now. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Extend your hand this way and let's pray. Come on, let's pray. God, God, I know. I know what you can do in this moment. I felt it. I've seen it in my own life. I've seen it in my own life. Even when I didn't see what you were seeing, I had your presence. God, I don't want to go anywhere without your presence. Come on. God's presence is strong enough in your addiction to break it. God's presence is strong enough that you've been praying for your mom and dad, they won't come to church. Mom and dad, you've been praying for your child, they won't come to church. God's presence will give you the strength to pray one more time. Just like Samson, God, one more time. And what the greatest work of his life happened when he prayed one more time. Hello? Come on, pray that one more time. Pray for them. Another minute, pray for them. Heal. 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 God, let them see. They've heard. They've, they've heard that you're a healer, but let them see that you're a healer. Come on, reach out to him and ask him for healing from that sickness. Let me increase your faith. This week at a camp here in South Florida, a young girl with internal injuries had been in the hospital for two weeks before this camp. She has an internal disease where she bleeds out and she swells in incredible pain. 17 year old beautiful girl pastor's kid at camp going through she had prayed for people all week but she was just struggling with this on the night that we were praying for healing and she didn't get healed the first time and so she went into the back and she was upset and while we're at the end of this service much like this moment right here over off to my left comes a 14 year old 15 year old girl middle school girl and she says i have a word jeff i have a word and I, I bent down and I listened and she said, there's a person in here that has an internal bleeding and I want to pray for them because they're going to be healed. It's how, how about, how, how, give it up for the middle schooler, right? Sometimes God tries to speak to us, but it, it's the children. And I said, great, hang on to that, hang on to that. And I didn't know this story. And all I said across the hundreds of students in the room, I just said, if you're in this place and you need healing of internal organs, I want you to raise your hand and nobody right nobody at first and then after about 30 seconds maybe 45 seconds she raised her hand in the back right there and i didn't even know the whole story that i told you and i said go back there right this as soon as the middle schooler touched her stomach no it did it as soon as she touched her stomach heat came all over this 17 year old girl went through her inner her inner inner um, organs and she began to bend over and move see she was so swollen and hurt that she had a body thing on and she couldn't hardly move at all and she starts moving and shaking and she goes what did you do what did you god and she starts screaming and praising in the back and her youth group runs to her knowing what what was happening hear me in that moment she was instantly healed from a word of knowledge. She was restored in her faith back to God, was asking God to forgive her for her, right, her bitterness and her anger, and was called to the ministry that she hated. She did not want to go back into the ministry because her parents weren't healthy in that in ministry. All of that, she, the next day she comes forward and tells this whole story and the place erupted in praise because God can do anything in the last moment. 
I can see. Over 90. Pastor Marcus, come. Pastor Marcus, come. Over 90 healings this summer in camps. I'm speaking to nine camps across our country this summer. Oh, I've, I've done five. I have four left. Over 90 confirmed healings already. I could, t I could sit here and tell you the stories. Hear me. God can heal you. Those of you that have come in a moment's time, you saw the young man break free. Your faith will do that. God, heal right now. Heal. Will you lift your hands one more time and say, God, even though I don't see it, even though, come on, ask him one more time. God, even though I don't see it. I don't see it, you're 